Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's regular scheduled council meeting for February 18th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Nice, good crowd tonight. Thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Ms. Berner, if you would call in, please. Mayor Lowry. Here. Bear with me tonight. <laughs> I was waiting for some. I was waiting for some. It's slowly just been going away. Here. Councilwoman Hopkins. Councilman Grimm. Here. Councilwoman Nowakowski. Here. Councilman Cobb. Here. Councilwoman Eggleston. Here. Vice Mayor Cook. Here. Seven members present. Thank you. to talk to you. <laughs> All right, tonight's invocation will be by Councilwoman Hopkins. Dear Heavenly Father, we come here today to ask you for your help to guide us to do the right things for the citizens of New Crowell. And please protect the first responders and all our troops. Amen. Oh, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Is there enough seats for you guys? Yeah. Okay. All right, we will be, we will need uh, action uh, for the minutes for the work session on um, February 3rd, 2020. Make a motion accepted. Second. Any, uh, Hopkins. Correct. Okay. Any questions or comments? Council on the minutes? When you're ready, please. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Okay. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry? Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Uh, yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilman Cobb? Yes. Yeah. Minutes accepted, 7 0. Thank you. And then we will also need a motion for the regular uh, council meeting that was on uh, February 3rd, 2020. So, motion to accept. Mr. I heard Mr. Grimm first. Okay. And Whatever. Second. Was, okay. <laughs> Now, Kowski? Correct. Correct. Any discussion? <clears throat> when you're ready. <coughs> Councilman Cobb? Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston? Yes. Vice Mayor? Cole. Yes, ma'am. Mayor Lowry? Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins? Yes. Councilman Gray? Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski? Yes. Minutes accepted, 7 0. Thank you very much. Excuse me. All right. <clears throat> Moving down to communications tonight, we have a Parks and Rec Board application um, and do just a little quick short interview here with Mr. Nash. Is Mr. Nash here? Mr. Nash, good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening. Good, thanks. We got your application for the Parks and Rec Board. If you don't mind, just give us a quick rundown of, um, you know, just a little bit about yourself and why you would like to be on the board. Okay. Uh, I was born and raised in New Carlisle pretty much my whole life. Um, the uh, still a resident. I was hired at Five Rivers Metro Parks, which was the Dayton Montgomery County Park District at the time, but they changed their name due to confusion. And then uh, I worked there until 2014. So after 34 years, I retired. I've dealt with the park board there, uh, park board there. That the member, the, the board members there are all millionaires. I'm in no danger of being a millionaire, <laughs> but. Uh, I had dealt with them on certain topics and throughout my tenure there. And then okay. uh, I was, when I retired, I was a park manager and I'd been the park manager at a number of parks throughout the system. Okay. So, Council, uh, any questions for Mr. Nash? I would ask what Brandy thinks. Um, <coughs> yeah, so I'm one of the park board members. Okay. Um, so, what are the kinds of things that you would like to see happen with park board? Well, I, I'm totally unfamiliar with the park board, and, and, and I had, had asked Randy about what type of, like, clout they had or teeth they had or budget they had because I wasn't sure about what they had there. So I would pretty much just like to see what the budget looks like and see what kind of things the people in, in New Carlisle want to see happen and see what areas we have. I know of a few of the parks that are in here, but... Uh, I don't know, like the area behind what was the old West Lake uh, 
school. I don't know if that's something that's up for grabs. Who's you know it's you know like if we even own that, I don't know. So mm -hmm. that would be an area of development possibly. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything that you could think of right offhand that you would like to see happen? Like that you would like to see us do for the city? Well, one thing that impressed me most recently was walking the bikeway soon after it was put in. And uh, you know, I, I was impressed with how how nice it was, and and uh, I would like to see if we could connect it other ways, maybe go south um, to another bikeway. I was involved in a lot of bikeway work when I was there. Uh, you know, we walked areas, and before they even put the bikeways in, I walked and we planned out areas <coughs> where, where to take the bikeways and intersect with other bikeways and all that. Thank you, Brandy. Council, any questions for him? Mr. Nash? No? Well, she hit a couple of the questions I was going to ask, so I don't have any questions. If uh, Council uh, would like to make a motion to accept his application, they could do so. Make so move. Second. second. First and a second. Okay. Who got the first? Cook. Mr. Cook. Cook. Cook and Cobb, yeah. Council, any discussion before we vote? 34 years of uh, park experience. I uh, guess speaks quite a bit for itself. Yes. Sounds wonderful. We sound lucky to get. All right. When you're ready, ma'am. All right. <clears throat> Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilman Grimm. Yes. Councilwoman Nowkowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yeah. Motion accepted 7 0. All right. Congratulations, Mr. Nash. Thank you. Um, right. Have you been, uh, have you informed him when meetings take place or have you done so, Brandy? Not yet, but I can. Okay. So you guys can touch base. Okay. Okay. Great. Good. All right. Thank you very much. We All appreciate right. it. All right. Thank you. All right. And moving on to Jacob Burner from Tecumseh Strong. Sir, the the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for coming. Stand back here. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so again, my name is Jacob Berner, and I am a director of Tecumseh Strong, uh, new uh, kind of movement that's happening through the, the youth football organization and related to the high school as well. Um, a little background on what we're doing, and then I want to talk about some community service, and maybe maybe there's some partnerships we can even do with uh, the parks here. So. Background, we started because of a, 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 one of our, I coached football here in New Carlisle for several years for the Cubs, and one of the kids I coached, name was Colin Griffin, and Colin got sick with cancer a few years ago, and uh, if you were part of the community, you've probably seen all the fundraisers and the, the stuff we did to help him out, and I was able to, to go to his funeral and uh, talk there as well, but uh, we, were, we were doing a fundraiser at the middle school, and uh, we had a we had this this moment where we were we were just all praying at the whole, everybody in the whole school just gathered up and we, we were just praying for Colin that you know that something would happen and he was watching it on Facebook from the hospital and he hadn't been out of bed for a couple of weeks at that point he he uh, looked after that was over he looked at his dad and he said look we're going right now to this to the middle school and it was between the seventh and eighth grade basketball games so about the third or fourth quarter in the the eighth grade game Colin uh, comes in in his wheelchair and his mom and dad are there and. The place just gets extremely still, extremely quiet. The kids all start crying, both teams. The umpires just seize the game for about 20 minutes and just everybody just kind of gathered around Colin and hugged on him some. And at the end of that, Colin was able to address everybody. And this is what I want to read is what he addressed. And this is why we're doing what we, we're doing. So he said these words to all of us that were there. No matter what situation in life, you never give up. All right, I'm looking at every single one of you. I love you guys. Live your life as you only have one life because who knows what you can leave behind or not leave behind. And when Colin said those words, I mean, it, it struck our hearts. Um, I was able to speak at his funeral and, and I challenged everybody there to, to continue this, this legacy of love that Colin left. And so the Tecumseh Strong movement is founded in that legacy of love. And so in this process of, of going, working with Colin and all the kids and students and I had a lot of teachers and, and uh, coaches and people come up to me and say, how do we continue on? And I didn't know the answer until last fall. Uh, I just feel like we were stirred and we, we kind of had some clarity on what to do. And so we started this organization called Tecumseh Strong. And so it's not, it's not its own private organization. We actually, we are a subcommittee of the Tecumseh Youth Football and Cheer Association. 
So the 501c3 of that organization is our umbrella that we are serving under. Our direct oversight is with Coach Corey and then uh, Principal Dixon and Coach Emberton at the high school. So uh, middle school principal and the, and the two high school coaches are our direct oversight. And we're relation with the, the youth board is like a uh, extension of that board. Not, not necessarily, we don't run the youth program, nothing to do with that. We're focusing on four main areas. And I want to talk about those four areas and then the community service is a big part of what we're doing. Four areas of focus would be our resource arm, our community relations, flag to Friday, and leadership building. Uh, part of all of this is to help become a catalyst for our community, to bring some pride back, to bring leadership into our students and our athletes, to elevate uh, you know, this, this, I wanna say this unity that we found during this, this season when Colin, when Colin was struggling. So the first thing we did was we, we, we set up, we, we met with the school, we met with uh, the coaches at the football program. Uh, we helped put together a budget to renovate the athletic building at the high school. Uh, we've got several different groups that are helping make that project happen. It's, it's actually underway right now. Um, so we're, we're renovating the, the entire, almost the entire athletic building at the high school. Uh, that's one thing we're doing. The community relations part, we have a, a service project that we're trying to inspire our kids and community to get involved in every single month. And we started that in November. Last year was our first one. We kicked off a, a service a community event in Donaldsville where we asked everyone come. And we had around 200 volunteers from four and five year olds up to, you know, there was elderly 70, 70, 75 year old folks there. And we all just went and cleaned the Donaldsville Cemetery. We, you know, bagged the trash up. We, we actually cleaned headstones. We had Mr. Shooter come over and uh, show us how to do that process. Uh, and we called that a, a bucket event. And so every month we're trying to do a service project. So the following month we were able to write letters to the, um, the 82nd Airborne, I believe is what it's called. They were deployed, yes, 82nd Airborne. They were deployed uh, January 1st with no notice. And so they, they just went to work one day and told to get on the plane, you're going overseas. Um, not to take any electronics with you. So our kids all wrote letters to them. Uh, our, next, our next projects that are scheduled are coming up soon. Um, one of the tasks that I have is to get with the city of New Carlisle, especially the parks, and ask is there a way that we can help uh, come into a park with volunteer group and, and clean it up, you know, do whatever, bring our weed eaters, shovels, whatever we can do and, and, and clean it, whether it's a cemetery or a park, we would be willing to, to do at least one a year for the city or with the city, whichever what you, would, you would think would be the best route. We're trying to teach our kids a lot about community service and how to become leaders for the next generation. We, we believe that service is a, ma a massive piece of that. Uh, so that's part of the leadership structure. Talk about Flag to Friday just for a minute. In all these different areas, we have lots of stuff happening. I'm just going to do a few highlights. So the Flag to Friday element, um, we're, we're putting together what we're calling a Friday night reinvent. Uh, so starting next, this next football season, Friday nights at the high school, we're actually trying to bring activities uh, at 5 o'clock where the games start at 7. So from that 5 to 6.30 window, um, we've got lots of ideas and concepts that are in the, in the brew right now. Uh, some of those might be things such as uh, having a carnival type atmosphere for our opening day with a possible hot air balloon launch uh, from 5 to 6.30 and that would help bring money in for boosters plus bring community together. The second home game, uh, I'm going to be reaching out uh, sometime in the next week and asking if you guys would be willing to help with this is we want to honor all of our volunteer fire departments, police departments and service departments in our, in our community so we'd like to bring those guys out there, maybe some equipment and, and honor them from 5 to 6.30, have, a, have like an open, uh, you know, take a look at your, serv your servants here. So uh, that's a couple of them. There's lots of ideas in the works. Our next meeting for that is coming up in March on the 4th or 5th of Wednesday. Um, so that's one area, the Flag to Friday. There's lots of other things, but that's a, a pretty big one that we're looking at redoing. Leadership development with the high school kids. This Sunday we're having our first meeting with all of our program from the kids entering the seventh grade through high school. And we're gonna be going over a new leadership manual, uh, trying to understand a new vision for leadership with our kids. There's four major principles that we're talking about in there. Um, speak the truth at all, all the time, three principles that are really big, I guess, not four. Speak the truth at all times, no matter what. I should know these by heart now, and I gotta look. Hold on. Uh, goals and sacrifice. So we're gonna teach our kids and we're gonna establish goals with them. We're going to show them how to identify what a goal is, how to put steps down, 
and then uh, the sacrifice that it takes to make a goal happen, and then the truth about uh, making these goals or, the, or actually doing the work or not. And so the whole program as a whole is just completely revamping at the, from the football program all the way down. And Tecumseh Strong is leading uh, this vision of leadership. Uh, we've, we were able to meet with Rotary, and Rotary uh, actually sponsored our, our leadership manuals that are going to be going out. Every kid will be getting one of these. This is the leadership manual they're going to get. Uh, that will be this coming Sunday. This will stay with them from seventh grade through high school, through their graduation time, and it will be used to continue to do things, goal setting, but also uh, community service projects and communication piece. So this, this binder uh, will, be, will be a token that they're going to keep with them. We're going to really rate it high. So rather than me just talking on, I would rather answer questions about how we might be able to serve you guys or uh, if there's questions you got about who we are, just to make sure if I, if I call in the future and say, hey, I'm Jacob with Tecumseh Strong, you'll at least know who I am. So is there questions that I can answer? I'd rather spend time doing that. Okay, Mr. Cobb. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Byrne, thank you for what you're doing for the kids. Can I ask the age group of these kids? Okay, so the, the, our focus is from uh, flag football entry as far as the actual program itself. So kids that are entering the flag program, we want to help bring more people into the, uh, more of our kids into their flag football program all the way through high school. The leadership books in this focus of leadership, we're going to really emphasize starting in seventh grade. The principles we're sharing with the youth program that will start in, in the flag, um, and that's at what, second grade or kindergarten, Emily? Kindergarten. Kindergarten. Yep. So well, kindergarten through 12th grade. What I'm kind of looking at here, uh, along with Mr. Cook here and myself, we try to have fireworks every year. And we try to get some kind of involvement either with the Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts, excuse me, and maybe something like this where they come down and help us uh, do minor stuff, nothing heavy or anything like that for community service. Sure. Uh, don't know if you'd be interested for that. Possibly. Uh, you know, if we have, if uh, the community service projects we're doing, we are going to do through the month of June. Uh, starting with July, the kids start camp up and then their football, and we don't want to add in the months during the football season. Outside of the football season, we're willing to help uh, any kind of community service project that fits that we can get kids to. Uh, our, we've, had, we've, had, we've done two projects so far. Our first one, we had 200 people show up, and then our second one, we were in their parade here, and then we went to a farm, and we had around 50 that went to the farm and helped uh, prepare it for the winter, um, a nonprofit farm, yeah. Once we get the budget done, see if we're going to have money for fireworks, I'd like to get a hold of Yes, give, give me a call. Emily's got my contact information she can give to all of you guys. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, yes. I'd, I'd like to suggest that you at least look at some way that uh, the kids get to know their neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of people in town who are elderly now, which is a kind of a plague with small communities. And sometimes getting the snow off the sidewalks, yes, getting so, the leaves out of the yard is a tough thing, and yes. they can build community and get to know their neighbors and I agree with you 100%. One of the things that we were going to do in January, um, and it just did, we didn't get that snow, <coughs> snow day in January we were hoping for, we had a, uh, implemented what we called a snow day work day, where if school was canceled, we were going to put out and have all of our kids meet at noon, and we were going to meet at the four elementary schools, and then go into the community actually shoveling sidewalks. And so that is absolutely on our radar. Uh, and if you've got more ideas uh, this coming spring, you know, every month we're doing a service project. We, we started with the cemetery in Donaldsville. Uh, for Bethel Township, uh, we want to do a project for you guys. Uh, so at least once or twice a year, if we can, if we can get out here and serve this community, we, we want to bring our kids into the community. Any other questions, guys? Are you, um, do you, are you guys accepting, or do you guys need sponsorship slash donations? Or? We would love to have donations. Uh, we are totally, uh, no one is paid of anything. It's completely volunteer-led. Uh, and everything we do is through, through people just giving you know, funds, sponsorships and such. So if there's anything out there that... So I mean cash, sponsorships, or donations? Cash and donations, look, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So this year, just as an example, our, our initial budget we put together was $125,000. That seems outrageous, but it included the renovation of the school, uh, the athletic building at the high school. Uh, the high school is picking up most of that tab that has to do directly with that building. 
but all of the other stuff, so the shirts that were given away for all of our volunteers, and we had buckets and scrub brushes and, and all these other thousands of dollars in expenses has all been donated by the folks serving in the community. Uh, in the committee specifically, those that are leading it. So. Okay. Yeah, I think that, I mean, what, from what, you're, what you laid out is very important. I mean, I know you're hitting on a bunch of different subjects, but, you know, for like teaching the kids volunteer, how to volunteer and community, um, you know, community work is, it's, you know, I, for me, I think that's something that's slowly dying off that, that the, the newer generations need to get back into their sure. into their into their heart. I mean, it's you know when you're younger, you don't really. I mean, you know, when I was a teenager in high school, I didn't see the importance in that too much. But you know, when you get older, you really see. I mean, a lot of these programs, you know, school, church, you know, food pantries, festivals, you know, you name it. I mean, they can't run without uh, you know the volunteers and the community service that people put in for it. So it's a it's something that definitely needs to be shown how important it is. So, it's, so to add to what you're saying, one of the ways we're communicating that with our kids is every Saturday until school is out, we're hosting at 7 a.m. from 7 to 8.30, what we call Breakfast Club. And this is a, a place where the kids and every kid in our school district is invited. There's, there's no age limit, uh, male, female, doesn't matter. They can come at 7 a.m. and from 7 to 8.30, uh, they're going to get sports uh, training as far as speed and agility, but we also do uh, talks. We talk for five to ten minutes about a topic. So we've been working through community and family, uh, the, all the leader, leadership elements we're talking about, and then we feed them afterwards. Uh, we're feeding, last week we had around 50, we've had up to 70. 57 was last week. 57, okay, so we're running 50 to 70. Um, kids a week through there and they're of all ages uh, it's not just high school there's there's like there's some kids that aren't even in school yet that are four and five years old and, okay. and such and, and also just so you know Emily is on our committee uh, because of her her role in the, the youth program she's got an automatic spot on our committee to as our treasurer so uh, if you have other questions directly you can also ask Emily you guys I'm assuming have social media some yes okay. yes to come so strong uh, if you're following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, Noah's running our, our social media stuff here. Uh, we're trying to get at least a couple posts a week up about stuff we're doing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. It was a lot of good information. Yep. And that's then, one uh, of those questions. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Don? I might ask the stupid question, but are you guys a sound of the 501c3 with liability coverage? Yes. So, yes. So they're covered. Yes. Working yep. Thank you very much, John. Can I ask you a question? Ben? Sure. Um, have you tried Mommy Valley Regal? Regal Mommy Valley? I don't know what that is. Okay, that's there, there, there are three organizations that got together to rebuild after the tornado. Well, Northridge is still starting to get to be built. Uh, Dropwood is still pretty bad. A lot of places in the UC. The Church of the Brothers is from full time down there. Wow. Wow. Okay. So here recently we just started one house at a time, a little bit of multiple houses. It's our national office. My question is, we're going to be working with rebuild money balance. And that's the people to get a hold of for the tornado. And there's still a lot of cleanup. Right. Right. Our focus, we're really trying to focus on, is our township area, uh, but we would absolutely look at any request. So, but we're really trying to focus in on New Carlisle, Park Lane, Medway, Crystal Lake, Donaldsville area with our with our volunteer events. But if it's if it's something that we can even uh, share in our post and. Maybe there's some individuals that would want to participate. We'll gladly share that. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, sir. We All appreciate right. your time. Thank you. All righty. Moving on. City manager report. Mr. Bridge. You have the floor, sir. I do. Thank you. You, you, have, thank all you. The, you have all the good information. I do. I do. I do. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lowry, members of council, members of the public. I'd like to share with you the city manager report. <coughs> Uh, we'll start with a finance report with our finance director, Ms. Debbie Watson. Good evening, council and members of the public. Um, it's always good to see this, this amount of people coming out who's um, interested in knowing what's going on in their community. Um, I also belong to another community, and 
and we don't have that many people at our meetings, so it's nice to see people are interested in what's going on. Um, our January report, um, our total revenue in the general fund is $105,116.51. January total expenses for the general fund was $61,048.09. Our income tax um, revenue for the month of, this was actually January, sorry, is $137,000. $18.60. Year to date totals revenue collected so far for this year is $377,065.76. And year to date total expenses is $125,053.23. Um, I did include in your reports, Council, uh, some end of the year reports so you can have them uh, before our work session on Thursday just to look at some numbers and have some numbers in your head. Sure. Yeah. Just a couple. Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> if you have any questions. Council, any questions from Ms. Watson? Your to date is. I, I, see, I see what you're getting ready to ask already about that total revenue collected. Um, it's probably February, added in some of February's when I did the report, so that's, I'll, I'll correct that for next time. Okay. But that's probably what's happened there. I just, as I was reading, I stopped and I thought, oh boy, but I'll correct this for Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Council, for Ms. Watson? Thank you very much, Ms. Watson. We appreciate it as always. Thank you, Ms. Watson. And moving on with the city manager report, our service report with our service director, Mr. Kitko. Thank you, Mr. Bridge. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Council, members of the public. Uh, we'll start off with the Public Works Department. We do have some curb that has been marked out there with white lines. We are waiting, oops, to um, make sure we don't have any utilities underneath, and we'll uh, get excavating and get those fixed. Um, the Quonset Hut area during this winter, because it has been mild, we were able to get outside and do a lot of cleanup around our uh, street department. So we were able to organize plows, get trucks parked where they're supposed to be, um, we cleaned back a ton of trees and brush to open that up and not make it so tight for deliveries and our crews working. Uh, water department, water treatment plant, old high service pump building. That was in last year's capital improvement and a little bit in this year's capital improvement to basically overhaul the old high service pump building that came from the original 50s plant. Uh, that is basically all rehab except for the existing pumps. And as pumps go out or motors go out, we will replace those also. Um, and those include uh, the uh, pipe fittings, valves, heaters, dehumidifier, and general cleanup. Um, we will probably be starting on that here in the next week or two. The waste uh, sanitary survey was also completed, a very in-depth one. In the 20 years I've been with the city, this is the uh, deepest inspection that we've ever had and this is going through all utilities any water treatment um, it was a, a day and a half where typically it used to be like an hour to three hours and this went all the way from uh, the smallest little paper clip that you got to any infrastructure that you in, infrastructure you have to the financial stability of the department to where you plan on going for the next 20 years Asset management was put out by the Ohio EPA, and I got to give uh, a lot of credit to uh, Bob Hoke and uh, Derek um, Hutchison, who basically got the asset management plan, capital contingency plan, and all these documents together that all they wanted to see was a portion of this document ready, because they know in October that not everybody's going to have it. Uh, we were highly touted as having a very, very thorough plan already in place. Of course, it's not 100%, it'll probably never be 100%, but that's why you constantly change it and add to it. So I gotta give that crew um, a, a, a big applause for what they did to get that ready and, and get that kind of uh, hype from the EPA. But with that being said, there are some things that they did find, some from 15 years ago, some from 10, new, new regulations, those will be coming out. I will keep council up to date, and um, when when I got to respond to the report, I'll be bringing those to you, and then um, talk about some of the things that uh, were found, just to keep you know everybody abreast of our department. Wastewater treatment plant, uh, the influent building uh, construction project, which included two brand new influent pumps, which are our only means to pump all the sewer that comes from the city, uh, mobile home parks north of the city, nor uh, north. Uh, 
uh, Northampton and um, Northwestern Local School District. We get uh, sewer all the way from there. Uh, so we got those new. Bar screen is in and up and running. It has been, um, I just gotta say it's awesome. Uh, we are clearing out so much debris out of the water that our pumps do not have to worry about tearing that stuff up. Those flushable wipes, I still don't want them flush, but we are catching those now. Uh, they are not getting through. So it has been a, um, a great project. It is definitely helping out the rest of the plant. Uh, final payment will be made here in the next week or two, and we will be done with that project, and we'll be looking at 2021 to start our repayment. The 2019-2020 primary number one clarifier project, uh, demolition install for the clarifier uh, is getting ready to start ex except for the concrete structure, and that tentative construction date is around March 9th. Uh, same contractor will be performing that work. Um, they are very familiar with our plant. And then once we get done with that, we will get them all paid up. And that will also begin repayment for that loan in 2021. 2020 uh, road project estimating. Uh, I've been looking at budgets and estimating, trying to see kind of what roadways. Um, we kind of finished up a lot of where we are standing with the levy this year and kind of what we feel uh, upon the anticipated uh, revenues with the new gas tax that come in. I will be meeting with Randy a little bit to kind of finalize how much of that additional gas tax that we'll be kind of using for what purpose, because it is all new monies to us here at the city on top of what the regular street fund has had um, for many years. And then uh, traffic signal upgrade project as the new traffic signals that, be, that will be at Maine and Jefferson and Maine and Lake. Uh, we have a pre-construction meeting coming up here March 16th. Uh, once I get through that meeting, I will update council and probably get something out to members of the public on um, where we are with, you know, waiting on those poles to be built and when they anticipate construction. Of course, as stated in the past ones, we will, that construction so it must be complete prior to the um, heritage of flight, uh, just so we don't close down Main Street and have construction going on. And that is all I have in my report, or um, I can entertain any questions about it or anything else going on with the service. Mr. Cobb, Mr. Kiko, have you utilized some kind of a plan to inspect this stuff over here at the wastewater treatment plant? And, uh, and so, what kind of plan, I'm sorry? So we don't wind up with a big hit bill on like the clarifier. Yeah, there, there, there are, we, we follow an O&M manual um, to inspect all the equipment. Uh, just with the new equipment, we got its own M manual, and from day one, we, we do those inspections also. Um, we have stepped up the inspections, uh, try to be uh, a little more detailed because it is 40 years old. So the own M manual may say, check this screw, you know, once a month. We might be actually be looking at the screw more than just checking it. Right. So, but yeah. But I mean, I don't want to end up like we did on the water tower. Nobody inspected it for 30 years. Then all of a sudden, boom, we had to fix the painting. I don't want to see something like that. I mean, if we stay on top of the spectrum, then we can catch it early enough. I mean, that's just my opinion. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Maybe sure. I missed something. We keep talking about the lights at Main and Lake, and the lights at Main and Jefferson. Mm -hmm. What about the light at Church and Jefferson? Um, to keep it short, that is a non-conforming traffic signal. Uh, so if we were to request federal funding uh, to get that done, um, that traffic signal will more than likely go away. And then one of the, the state route will be the thoroughfare, and then Church Street will have a stop sign. So uh, anything we do there, we have to do possibly with local funds and just kind of, I wouldn't say uh, tread lightly, but we just have to be careful because that, that traffic light is non-conforming. It's non-conforming. Uh, there's various things. It's traffic counts, accidents. Uh, there's various things that go into it uh, that they determine on what is what is allowed and what is not allowed. As you see in Springfield, they've eliminated a lot of traffic lights. Mm -hmm. It's for that same purpose. Uh, they just they don't serve a purpose of time, um, traffic crossings, uh, pedestrian crossings. Um, they don't hinder, the, you know, sometimes it's more of a congestion issue and they're not timed with anything. So to keep that light, we just keep our mouth shut. It, that's what we've been doing for a while. <laughs> Your secret's safe with me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had looked at that intersection when we tried to get federal funding for this one as well. 
Okay. Yeah. Anything else, Mr. Graham? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Howie, I just had a couple. One, um, I think we've said it a couple times over the past year or so, but good job to you, uh, Ms. Watson, Mr. Bridge, and obviously council, past council members, uh, for the for the rate of road repair you guys have been knocking out. I mean, I know there's still many streets with you know, problems and whatnot, but I mean, if you look at New Carlisle's history of repairing roads probably 10 years ago, I mean, it's just, I mean, there can always be better or more improvements, but they've done a good job as far as really picking up the pace on it. And, uh, hopefully you guys can keep that pace up. So thank you on that. Um, on your um, on your survey report, just uh, just real quick. Um, so overall, I mean, was it a decent report? I mean, like you said, I don't think you could ever get perfect, but I mean, uh, the the report is good. Uh, they will we will have probably I don't want to say numerous. We're going to have some recommendations. Right. Uh, it was a very new person. Uh, the person going out um, has seen it before. So with the, the rules that are coming around with, uh, and, and I'll just throw this out there, uh, our water plant does not have a restroom. And it's built because it's on the isolation radius of our wells. So basically we've had it for a while. It's passed inspections before. We've had it out there, we don't hide it. Um, but basically this portage on we have is gonna go bye-bye. Um, the possibility of the concession stand that is for the new New Carolina Baseball Softball Association, they've had those little gray water tanks that are out there. That potentially is going to go, and they may just have to go into um, a bucket and it, it go away that way. There won't be any holding tanks on site. So little things like that. There's going to be recommendations, things we've passed before. Um, the one uh, that we, will, we are going to get hit on is Adam Street Tower. Um, as I, as every, we've been talking about for some time, because we got that one um, getting it painted. I mean, it wasn't going to fall down or anything. But Adams Tower, um, if not needed, they basically said, you know, if you're going to take it out, take it out. Um, you know, if you don't need it, there, there's no need to hold on to something from 1938. I, I like the looks of the tower. That, that's my other side. I, agree, I like, you know, everybody else, what they want to say about it. But its sole purpose was to uh, provide water pressure to a town. Only, only purpose. And uh, so we are going to um, have a notice on that tower um, on you know, fixing it. And I already spoke with the EPA and I said, you know, our, our goal is to not put in you know, 350 to 500 some thousand dollars into it and have to do it again in another 15, 20 years. And then have to do it again. And, then, and it's also on church property we have an easement to that. So it's just how much money, that, that's where the survey portion is, but the rest of it, there'll be recommendations, things that they gather. Um, we fall under the same rules as Cincinnati, Columbus. You know, the big, the big ones that get hit with a lot of those rules, we're, we're no different. We have to live underneath those same things. We don't get uh, preferential treatment because we're in a small little town, there's not much um, hazards going by, anything like that. But it's, it's a pretty good report. If that tower was to come offline, you know, you decide you don't need it, un, you know, shut it down, whatever you, whatever it is you do, they can't force you to take it down, can they? No, they won't force this. It, in, our, in our ordinances, it's already written in the, in the agreement with the church that it will be removed by the city. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, one more thing. I'm sorry. The water lines, this is, we haven't talked about this in a while. Any status or what, what's going on between the city and 571 as far as water and sewer going out west? Um, we've been working back and forth. Uh, just... I think uh, 571 is working with their consultant on what they really want to do, um, and it, it's it's really all on them. We're okay. I'm waiting for them to kind of give me the final package before I approach council for approval for them to um, connect to our system. But as far as you know, they're I've I've been under the understanding the whole time that they are truly interested first in sewer is their greatest thing, and then water won't either will be at the same time or it won't be far behind. Okay. All right, that's all I had. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kiko. Moving on with the city manager report, our fire report with our fire chief, Chief Trustee. Mayor, council, citizens. Uh, in the month of January, the New Carlisle Fire Division responded to seven, 77 EMS calls in the city, 14 in Elizabeth Township. The division responded to four related fire-related calls in the city and three in Elizabeth Township, which gave us right now our per year total right, run number 147. 
Uh, we had three EMS calls answered by mutual aid by Pike Township or Bethel Clark due to Medic 52 being on response. We answered two mutual aid EMS runs for Pike Township and one EMS run for Bethel Clark. In the month of January, the division responded to three overdose calls. One of the calls was what we call a double overdose. We had two patients overdosed at the same time. And on both instance, all the patients were revived by Narcan. Uh, something a little exciting for us for the division. We've re the division has partnered with Red Cross for a new smoke detector program, uh, which where we, will, we have the smoke detectors now uh, for free. That all we ask is that if you want one, contact the station at 845-8401, and one of our crews will come out and install the smoke detector by the program that we've uh, partnered with Red Cross, we have to install them uh, and come out and install them, fill out a form as to where we install the map, the residence address, and that type of thing. Uh, but what's neat about these smoke detectors is they have a 10-year battery in them. It's no more having to remember to change the battery twice a year and all that. With these, it's a 10-year battery, and it's a super, super neat program with us. Uh, we're working it to hopefully in the spring to do a target area of the city and go out and do a one or two day thing where we just flood that area with smoke detectors going door to door uh, putting them up and maybe working with a, uh, some of the, either the schools using some of the kids for community service uh, we're also looking to reach out to get donations from corporations to where we can purchase um, co detectors to have those along with the smoke detectors to put in the in the homes also for free uh, but like i said if anyone needs one please Please call us. Our crews will come out. They'll install it for you where it needs to be in the home, free of charge. And like I said, these smoke detectors are really nice. They're, they're neat detectors. And the only thing you need to do is take a broomstick maybe once a month, whatever, hit the test button, make sure it beeps. Um, but like I said, they have a 10 year, 10 year battery life, which is pretty unheard of anymore. Council, any questions for Chief? Ms. Hopkins. Yes, ma'am. Do you know if the Red Cross or this program has any uh, smoke detectors or smoke alarms for deaf people? I don't know if they do. I can find out. I know they, they are made by First Alert and some of the other companies that they will, um, instead of getting an audible alarm, they'll have a very bright visual alarm. Uh, and then sometimes they're tied to another alarm, like especially in the sleeping area, that will be uh, next <coughs> to their bed or something like that. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Hopkins. Anyone else? Mr. Trustee. All right, Chief. Thank you for the report, sir. Are we okay, are we allowed, or are you okay with Council or anyone else who is sharing that info on the smoke detectors? No, go right ahead. We've already we've already put it out on our web on our Facebook site, and I've also put it on the New Carlisle IF website also. Okay. Thank you very much. Ridge. Thank you, Fire Chief. And moving on to the City Manager's report, our uh, police discussion with Deputy Major Sack. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, members of the public, thank you. This is a report is from January 2020. This year is our first report for the year. Uh, deputies uh, responded to 131 calls for service in the city. Of those 131 calls, uh, there were zero assault calls, seven domestic violence calls, two theft. There was a non-injury crash involved with that and then one injury crash involving an ATV. Ten citations written with 33 warrants. Apparently didn't have any, uh, which is a good thing, drug complaints of that month. We did have, there is a uh, misprint on here. We did have three overdoses as the fire chief reflected earlier. We had one attempt at suicide and 44 criminal arrests. On January the 27th, we, uh, Deputy Anthony Blything, his name is Tony, is going to be uh, actually was assigned to New Carlisle as the uh, new fifth deputy in the city. And uh, Anthony is in a 10 week program right now. Once that 10 week program is done of his training, he'll be released to the road. Uh, and that fifth deputy will be actively working on the road uh, once that training's complete. Uh, we had some thefts where an uh, individual was stealing a, a propane tank from one of our residents here. Uh, I actually took the first report of that and then he got new propane tanks and hooked them up and then the guy come back and cut the uh, wire that he had them attached with and took those as well. Well, the mistake he made this time, thankfully for us, was it had snowed. 
So we followed him, his footprints. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> once we got the call, we was able to go there. And, and when we opened the door to where they were at, lo and behold, there were the heaters in the house being operated with the propane tanks that they had stolen. So he was arrested and taken to jail and uh, the uh, equipment, the propane tanks were returned to their <coughs> rightful owner, which is, I'm happy that we was able to do that. And um, once again, just by that happening, so they, they call us and we're able to get out and track that down. So if you see anything, no matter how small it is or looks, give us a call because we're, we're diligent, we're trying, we, you know, we're out there and if we, if we see it, we're gonna follow through with it and, and um, do the best we can do. So this report was put together by Sergeant Ralph Underwood and uh, he asked me if I would uh, share that with, with you today. And that concludes it. Thank you, sir. Council, any questions for Deputy Major Sack? Yes. Sir. Isn't training for deputies supposed to be 13 weeks? Um, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question because I, I, I'm not a supervisor, I don't know that, but I, I just know that, uh, I'm, I think I'm reading here that it would said 10 weeks. Okay. Um, but it may, all together, it may be that, to be honest with you, sir, it, it, there may be some extra included that he may get out on the road. It may just take the 10 weeks to get him out actually on the road. And there may be some other training in the back end that, that, that covers that. I'm not 100% sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, Deputy Major Sec, thank you for the report. We appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bridge. Thank you, Deputy Major Sack. And moving on with the city manager report under informational items, estimating bidding update. Unfortunately, there is no new information from the last time we met. I did reach out to the architect Thursday of last week, um, and I did hear back from one of the companies that is working on the estimate, and hopefully we'll have it done by this week. Uh, so as soon as that number is passed me, I will gladly pass along to council. Uh, 2020 operating budget. We have our work sessions uh, scheduled for Thursday, February 20th, and Friday, uh, February 21st. That is this Thursday and Friday. Uh, it's scheduled to run from 2 p.m. until 6 p.m. It will be at our uh, fire station, so it will not be here at the shelter house. This is booked for a prior engagement. So that is open to the public. We encourage the public to attend. Um, so over those two days, we'll be going over your budget and deciding how we're going to spend the taxpayer dollars moving forward uh, uh, for the remainder of this year. Uh, we do plan on introducing that budget to City Council on uh, March 9th, 2020, during regular session. And that will be voted on on 316, which is the meeting, the second meeting of the month. So please, uh, all those meetings are open to the public. We'd love to see you in attendance. Uh, meetings attended, I went to a few good meetings uh, uh, over the past two weeks. On February 4th, had a downtown business, owners, uh, down, excuse me, downtown business owners meeting at Stage Co. Cafe here in town. Um, it was hosted by them and put on by Gateway Business Group. So it was a great, and, uh, a great little meeting. We got together with some downtown business owners to figure out what they uh, needed to help them succeed. I do believe the mayor showed up for that meeting and then also uh, Councilman Eggleston and also Councilman Eggleston Nowakowski. <coughs> so it was a really good brainstorming session. We came up with some really good ideas. Uh, so we're excited to see what comes of that meeting in the coming months. Uh, also attended with uh, Councilwoman Eggleston Nowakowski a strong community <coughs> meeting and that had to deal with uh, definitely food issues that maybe uh, we uh, are anticipating having or that are we, are, we are currently having. So two good meetings. Uh, hopefully we get some great work out of those coming in the future. iPads for City Council. They will have a training session on Mar uh, March 2nd. Starts at 5 p.m. That is here. <coughs> Again, that is open to the public as well. So if you want to come and see how they're learning the user iPad, you are more than welcome to do that. But again, we will be meeting at 5 o'clock on that day. Then we will be going to the 6 o'clock regularly scheduled work session and then into the 7 p.m. regularly scheduled work session. So it will be kind of a long afternoon for us, but the end result is uh, council decided to get iPads so we don't have to print out so much paper because it is a lot of paper. We have to give eight copies of them and then we have five paper. copies here. So we are looking to reduce some of the uh, uh, money that we do spend on that. Now, when it comes to high school career and job fair, I actually signed up for that. So the city of New Carlisle will be attending. That is March 16th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, I will be asking a few council members to kind of show up throughout the day, sit with me for a couple hours. I'm also discussing the same thing with some of our department heads and some other employees. Uh, we literally just registered for that, I think, Thursday of last week. So 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. to come to high school is having a fantastic job here, and we are very excited to be a part of that. Uh, bicycles at Madison Street School. We have approximately 45 bikes that our police officers have confiscated um, or someone left them, whatever the case may be. But over the years, we have 
amassed quite a bit of amount. They are being stored at our Madison Street School. Uh, there is a nonprofit uh, called FYI, just right right out here side of town. They take the they take the bikes, they refurbish them, and they give them out to people who would use them. So I am seeking a motion to approve from council tonight that we do donate those bikes to FYI, so that organization can put them back out to use. Mr. Mayor, motion to Mr. I would move that we give those bicycles to FYI, and provided that they be refurbished and given to city kids. Second. Any discussion on that before we call for a vote, Council? I think Mr. Bridge covered it pretty good. When you're ready, Ms. Burner. Okay. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilman Grant. Yes. <coughs> Councilwoman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yeah. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council, for uh, approving that measure. <coughs> and that is all I have for the city manager report, so I'd be happy to entertain any questions. <coughs> Council, any questions for Mr. Bridge this evening? <coughs> well, I hate to be a pain. Yeah. The budget is going to be introduced at a March 9th regular meeting. Oh, did I get my date wrong? That is very well possible. Second? Yeah, second. it's supposed to be the second. Thank you. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. I was afraid there was a meeting I didn't know about. <sighs> thank you, Mr. Grimm. All right, Mr. Bridge, thank you for the report as always, sir. Thank you. All right, drop down to comments from the members of the public. Anybody has any questions or comments, please go to the podium. We'll need your name and address for the record, please. John will get him first, and then we'll go to you, John. John Craybacher, 307 North Henry Street. Um, I just want to give you a quick report on the garden. Then I need to ask the chief. Chief and I had a conversation the other day, so he knows what we're going to say. Um, the garden, you know, over at Westlake, you notice that there's a big hoop house, you know, and there, that means that we can, um, well, we can grow longer, in you know, longer periods of time and we can start sooner. It's 20 by 46. It is portable, so according to regulations, we do not need a, uh, a uh, license or to, because we can move it. And it. All we do is take chains off, hook it up to the tractor, and we go wherever we want to go with it. Um, so anyway, so uh, I'm over there working diligently now. Uh, right now we have six beds in. <coughs> Uh, which means we could probably start planting as early as March 1st. Um, according to WHIO, the polar vortex is, is going to stay up high, so that's good for us. Um, the temperature in there, in there was 30 degrees outside and it was 50 degrees inside, which is very good you know, for us right now. Um, going on over to um, Madison, the place over in Madison, we're going to start to rebuild some of the beds that we started with in the very beginning because we didn't use good wood in the very beginning, so now they're starting to fall apart. And so we're starting, you know, we're going to look at you know, how we can repair those. There's probably about eight beds right now that needs to repair. Again, this year, you know, we have what's called, uh, we've started off at the library. At the library, we're going to get some more uh, four by four beds, and they're going to have classes uh, arranged on Thursday, Thursday night. Now, right, Linda? Thursday night. I guess maybe Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday night. And what's interesting about the library, also the extension service is going to also hold classes over there on how to prepare food, how to store food, and so they're already over there with their worm farm. So if you ever want to see some wriggly, you know, uh, worms, they, they've got those. Anyway, things are looking better uh, once the weather breaks. Um, we're going to a meeting tomorrow with, at the um, Extension Service. And so we're going to probably have free plants this year also, again, this year with free seeds. You know, it is possible for you to garden and not pay a dime. But however, even a four by four plot, you can feed one person for a whole, whole year. 
So we have uh, just ordered 20 more for the Westlake property. And I'm sure Mike and April has seen the four by fours over there. And they're gonna be better this year. This year we have mulch. <laughs> We have mulch, and so and we have a lot of mulch, <laughs> let's put it that way. But we're going to be using that, you know, as much as we can. So anyway, that's what's happening with the garden. We're really happy at what's happening. Um, Chief and I got into a discussion last Sunday, you know, uh, and I'm going to ask him to, you know, expound on that a little bit. And we see on TV, and, we'll, and I've also done some reading, that... Um, but cancer with our first responders. And what I have found out is that a lot of workers' comps, a lot of insurance companies uh, do not cover that. It doesn't cover the cancer for first responders. And so I asked the chief, and I hope, you know, I'm going to ask him to go ahead and expound on it a lot more. Uh, I asked the chief if our first responders are under that you know, if they have the proper insurance, you know, even, even if they come off of duty, if they're even retired, and they get can you know, or lung cancer, that could be a, a, a delayed reaction from due, when they were on duty. And that's becoming a big thing, you know, uh, th throughout the country, with, especially with first responders. Chief? Yes, um, cancer right now in the fire service one out of every five firefighters will develop cancer either on the job or after retirement. Um, the biggest thing that we're trying to do is break the stereotype of the dirtier your gear is, the dirtier your helmet is, the cooler the firefighter you are. Um, that's what's killed a lot of our firemen, or firefighters, excuse me. Um, and we've instituted a lot of different pr uh, programs in cleaning the gear. We decon now at, at on scene. Uh, with our firefighters before they even come back to the station. Last year, we received a grant through Workman's Comp to purchase uh, cancer retardant uh, Nomex hoods, the hoods that the uh, firefighters wear underneath their helmets and masks um, and gloves. And so now all of our firefighters are issued two sets of gloves and two sets of, uh, or two hoods. That way, anytime they go on a call or a fire, they have a hood and gloves to swap out with while their other one is uh, washed and sanitized. Um, as far as workman's comp, yes, we are covered under the workman's comp program for uh, cancer. The way that works, though, is a person must have been on duty uh, or worked as a firefighter, either volunteer or part-time paid or full-time paid for at least five years and show proof that the cancer that they acquire has something related to fire service. It could be anywhere from uh, the biggest cancers that firefighters are coming are uh, coming up with right now is lung cancer, of course, um, colon cancer, uh, testicular cancer, um, skin cancer, uh, from just from the fact of being, in, being around the carcinogens. Um, the biggest thing that we fight right now is after the fire's out, going in for overhaul and cleanup, guys are tired. They're, they're, you know, they just fought a fire. They're ready to get done and go home, and they go in to do the overhaul and the cleanup without air packs on. And that's where a lot of it's coming from. Our standard policy of our department is you wear an air pack until the command officer tells you not to wear an air pack. Uh, so, uh, but yes, we are covered under workman's comp. There's a lot of drawbacks with it. Um, workman's comp will also, if, if they, they say that they will not fight a claim if it's firefighter cancer, um, it's getting a lot of press <coughs> right now. Uh, if they do agree to the claim, the agency that the claim goes against automatically uh, takes the highest penalty for workman's comp. What is it? We're, what we pay, comp compensation. Uh, there's one I understand there's a one time waiver with that. Uh, but we are covered. But like I said, the biggest thing with, with cancer in the fire service right now is educating our firefighters. Mm -hmm. um, and for quit using stuff that causes cancer. For yeah. years, we yeah. fought uh, fires with what they call high expansion foam for aircraft fires, and now it's a cancer causing agent. Mm -hmm. So, my, that myself, including in all the fireworks, worked the right path, that type of thing, are watching that really close to see if we come up with anything. Um, we've already got, I already know of three firefighters on right path that have 
some type of lung disease or lung cancer uh, due to yeah. Thank you very much, Keith, for the information. John, thank you very much for the update. All right. My name is Brandon Wright. I live at 233 Prentice Drive. Um, a little bit nervous talking in front of everybody. Uh, but I wanted to bring to light a problem that's been going on in our neighborhood for a while um, that my community members around where I live uh, would like basically the city to know what's going on and to help us out if we can. Um, so cats is a big problem in the city. Um, I wanted to bring this up because we live at one of the meccas. And by that, I mean our, our neighbors at 235 Prentice Drive, they feed um, these cats. So anywhere throughout the day, there's three to nine cats. Um, I have some photographic evidence that I can pass around to. Um, but at one time, I've counted nine cats. Um, not only that, I've had to chase cats off my roof that have peed on my garage. Um, I've seen three or four cats on top of my garage itself, um, not including my house, my neighbor's house. Um, they have problems with the cats going in their flower beds and things like that. Um, my kids can't play in the front or the backyard without us going outside to check. Um, and that's just ridiculous, in my opinion. Um, this is a health hazard, and also one of our vets actually told us that these stray cats throughout the area that are being kept up by feeding and stuff like that are adding to the horrible heartworm problem we have in this location. Um, they constantly poop by my front door. So when people come up, it gives the illusion that I'm a dirty person, that our house is dirty. They pee by my front door. It is disgusting. Um, I changed my mulch to lava rock because they're jagged, um, but they decided to pee and poop in front of my lava rock now. Um, but I'm going to fix that. Um, oh, and did I mention a couple days after buying my car, they jumped on it and scratched up the hood and um, the top of my car. So I got scratches from these animals. Um, and I was furious. Uh, me and the other neighbors are tired of this. That's why they wanted me to bring this to light. Um, and we need the city to intervene um, to not allow these residents to feed cats outside, whether it's a new ordinance, a revision of the current ordinances, which I'm going to go over, um, that some of these actions fall under. Um, and the code I'm referencing is in the ordinance 618.01, which is animals at running at large. Um, subsection A, 618.01 6 states, no person who is the owner or keeper of horses, mules, cattle, sheep, goats, swine, dogs, cats, or geese, or other foul animals shall allow or permit them to run at large upon public ways or upon unenclosed land or upon the premises of another without permission. And I believe that the individuals who are feeding these animals around the community are violating this ordinance, uh, which is subject to fine per the code. Um, also, subsection C of 618.01 states, no owner, keeper, harborer of any dog or cat shall fail at any time to keep it either physically confined or restrained upon the premises of the owner, keeper, or harborer um, by a leash, tether, or secure enclosure to prevent escape. Um, that there is another violation from these individuals in my um, opinion. And then also, um, under section 618.13, nuisance conditions prohibited, subsection B states, no person shall allow any animal under his or her control to be upon public property or upon the property of another absent the consent of the owner or occupant of the property without some device for the removal and containment of such animal's excrement. Um, nor shall any person fail to promptly remove any excrement deposited by any animal under his or her control on public or private property. So I am just trying to get some help from the city with this, whether it, like I said, a, a new ordinance, um, some enforcement for these individuals feeding these animals, because I live right beside this. And to be honest, it is ridiculous. I have cats tra traipsing through my backyard. They have a little tree where I see four or five cats a night. Um, again, I have some photos I can pass around. Um, there's about nine cats in one photo at nighttime just sitting there. Um, there's five cats in the other one with photos of plates of food, um, paw prints, scratches on my car, um, things like that. Uh, and I just, I want this enforced somehow, some way, because I know this is not just me. Granted, I'm in a partial mecca of it because they feed these things. Um, and I know they spay and neuter, they capture them. They're good people, don't get me wrong. But that's not the issue. The issue is that more and more are coming to that location and through my house, through my yard. Um, I just had two in my garage and you know how I found that out. 
they climbed in there when I opened the door one time because they were feeding them outside and they were peeing in my garage. So I had to move all my stuff, sanitize, and clean out my garage. It was disgusting. Um, and then also, I just, I'd like something done. The budget's coming up. Maybe possibly get some animal control out here for a couple weeks with the city budget to do like a cleanup before they start breeding and stuff like that in the springtime. Um, because there's four kittens under my neighbor's shed last year. Um, and they had, uh, one of them had a rare disease condition, which was contagious to other animals. So if it would have gotten near a dog or eaten by another animal, it would have spread. Um, they actually got that to, was that the His Hand of Prayers? or uh, that sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, they actually got that one taken care of. But the fact is these creatures are, it's a health hazard. They're spreading feces and urine. My kids can't play. It's utterly disgusting. And um, it's a hazard for other animals, spreading disease and things like that. And I just want something done. Right off the top of the bat, I, I thank you for bringing it up because I, I deal with similar issues myself. I've got my front flower beds and I've, I've caught them in my garage, same thing. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Bridge or Deputy Major Sack, I think the rules are probably pretty set in place. It's you find a cat that's out and you, you take it to who you think may own it. It's not like, I mean, is, is that the trick is, or, or the loophole, I guess you could say is, you can't prove that they own it if there's no tag on it? Would that be? No, actually, if they're feeding, there's a part in that 618 he's referencing. I just don't know the subsection right off my head. Say you have a feral cat, and you feed that feral cat outside your house. That is now your cat according to our code. So they can sit there and claim it's not, but the fact that he has pictures and he has their feeding, we can say that these are your cats. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've actually spoke with you on the phone about this. Was it you or someone else? It was not me. Okay, gotcha. Um, I'm working with another resident too on a dog feces issue. So um, I will be having a meeting with our deputies about enforcing certain sections of our code. It is punishable by a minor misdemeanor. Those are slaps on their wrist, but usually one person gets it then it, hopefully it kind of has a ripple effect. So I'm gonna be very honest when I say this and we will try to help you the best we can. This is a very hard thing to really get knocked down. You know, there are people that go out and they take the cats, they'll fix them, but they have to take them back to where they found them. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, you do alleviate the problem of reproduction, but they just take them right back to where they were to begin with. Um, as far as, you know, sending our zone guy out, that's something I think is gonna be better handled by a police officer, because they, our zone guy cannot, cannot put someone in the court for a minor misdemeanor. Um, that would be one of our police deputies <laughs> do it. We would have to see that in action, as the deputy would probably let you know he can't write a ticket for something that he doesn't witness firsthand. So I think there's ways that we can do better now that's been brought to our attention, not only in this gentleman's circumstance, but also with species uh, over on the Brookfield area, you know, um, that, you know, we can try to do something a little bit better, but these things are just very hard to get wrapped up, you know, because you'll get all the cats out and lo behold, another one comes around and, you know, and people have good intentions. They, they, they're, they're there with good intentions, but when we feed feral animals, they come back, and then other animals come with them. And it creates a problem that this gentleman is facing an undue hardship because his neighbors are feeding feral cats. And then we have the ripple effect that goes on, and now your life is being severely impacted by it, and I do apologize. <laughs> um, but we could do um, a better job with having our deputies type, take a look at it, which is something I was going to do based off of the conversation I've been having about Brookfield. Ms. Hoffman, if you don't mind me asking you something, because you were on council around this time, I think, didn't the city do some sort of, like, cat trapping at one time? They yes, they did. Mm. And it was about that same time, too, that we did the domestic pet ordinances as well that limited how many domestic pets someone could have. Okay. How did, do you remember how that went? I mean, was the cat trapping effective, or how did it, do you remember much about it? No, not really, because we don't really have a problem with our neighborhood. Okay. But it did go on, and it went on for several months. The trap, the trapping, you mean? Is that is that something that's that could is can be done, right, Mr. Bush? I'll have to look at our current code to see how it is, and then see if it's humane or not to do it that certain way. Well, what I was not the, not the trapping, or at least not that way. What I was going to say is, sure. he had mentioned an, animal control. Is it is animal control something where you could pay to have them? No, I don't know a lot about animals. It would yeah. be it would be like my concept. grandson works for a company that does trapping, and you could do that. 
Yeah. Well, well, no, there's something about something about the word trapping and under 618 that's sticking out to me says we can't trap unless it's done under certain circumstances. So we'll have to look at 618, <coughs> and <coughs> what we'll have to do is we'll go through it with a fine tooth comb. There may be something we can add to it to make it a little more stiffer, but we have a current code that guidelines this, and unfortunately, I don't know it like the back of my hand like some other aspects of our code, but I do believe trapping it, trapping is mentioned under that subsection. Now there's one other thing I want the city to keep in mind because this is a highly talked about topic throughout the town and that is blighting effects. Um, because of these animals, certain residents don't want to move in certain areas. Um, so you need to watch out for that. That's another reason I was seeking help because right now I know a couple people who just want to get out of there because of these cats. Oh, my. Um, so, yeah. And like you said, Mr. Bridge, I mean, skunks are always a problem because you're feeding the cats, the skunks are coming in for that as well. Exactly. And the raccoons Indeed. and things like that. So, many exactly. so it's a big, like you said, it's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. So. Now, I didn't know if you wanted me to pass around the photos I have. I mean, if you want, you're, I'll take them. I'll get Mr. Bridge. What I'll do is I'll scan them and email them to everyone so you guys can have them if that's okay. Yes. Or do you want to pass them? When they trapped the cats, the what did they do with them? There's some scratches on there from the pond. Where is it? Yeah, this is the one. Yeah. Is this the 235? Yeah. Oh. So both of these are 235? Yes. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Let me pass that down. I wanted to take a look at it. So when you look at it, you can tell they have a Mr. Wright, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll uh, keep in touch. All right. It's not my turn yet, but I want to talk about the cat thing for a second. I'm Brandy Mullet. I live at 522 Hamilton Avenue. Um, I do not at all want to diminish your concerns because I get it. I understand. But I've actually been looking. Um, there's a group that I follow on Facebook. They do host um, education to become a certified TNR, which is the Trap Neuter Return. Um, person and studies indicate experts indicate that true feral cat colonies and I'm talking cats that a human cannot touch if they are fixed and if they populate an area they will keep other cats from coming so like if you had let's say we have a group of we'll say six feral cats and then somebody down the street is just kind of letting their cat come and go those feral cats are gonna keep that other one from joining the colony i should say my concern is from what it sounds like is that maybe these cats are not actually fixed and that you know you said there's kittens under the on the under the shed so it sounds to me like maybe they're just not maybe they belong to someone they're not owning them responsibly and they're getting out procreating and then the problem just compounds and if that's the case then they're not truly feral and i don't know um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, it, two things actually. Number one, the Clark County Animal Shelter no longer deals with cats in any way, shape, or form. So that is going to be a huge issue with dealing with this. Um, I wish there was a cat, some kind of cat resource. Um, and then touching on to the trapping, I think you're going to be, because there's no licensing requirements for cats like there is dogs, there's no way to necessarily prove who owns them. And exactly like Mr. Lowry said, if you come to somebody and you're like, hey, this cat is causing a problem over here, they're gonna be like, well, I don't need my cat. So for me, being a cat owner, I have had a situation where my cats did get out once inadvertently. They are not outdoor cats by any main way, shape, or form, um, but they, they're not licensed. Luckily, I was able to find them, I was able to get them back, but if you introduce anything to where you're potentially trapping these animals and taking them away, I can tell you that if it was my cat, I would be livid. Um, I, mistakes happen, I under, and I'm not saying that I was at fault when my cats got out, I will admit that wholeheartedly. Um, but if it were to be a situation to where, you know, if I hadn't gotten lucky and found them, they came home about 12 hours later, um, and they were out for, you know, a couple of days, and somebody from the city were to come along and trap them and then take my cat, I'd be pretty ticked. So. Um, I think it's something that we definitely need to see what resources are available. Um, I just don't know the solution to the problem. Hmm. <coughs> My mom just mentioned to me apparently there is now a an organization that is dealing with cat rescue <coughs> called Anything Pausable. Um, I don't know a whole lot about them, but I think that they are trying. 
I think they're kind of in the infancy from what I've understood, but they're trying to get things up and running to where they can have an actual rescue for stray cats. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cobb. Mr. Mayor, five years ago, I got in a dispute over these cats. Randy remembers it. <laughs> but the county says it's the city's problem. The city says it's the county's problem. Because I brought up wanting to license these cats. And I went to the county commissioners. They said you got to go to the city and make an ordinance to put a license, force a license <coughs> on the cat. So that may be something to look at. I agree. Yeah, but you're just putting another code up in there that's going to be extremely hard to enforce. I'm just being very honest. Well, I know it's going to be hard. We went around this before. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're not getting no help from the county. Well, I mean, who's going to issue the license? Is that the stuff they're going to go to the county and get, like a dog license? It'd be the same as dog offset as cat license. And that has to come through the city. Does the county issue cat license? I've, I owned a cat for 19 years. I've never had a cat. So there, there's the problem. We can require you to have a license, but unless the city takes that on themselves and issues the license, which we're not in the market for, we don't have the manpower or the education or the experience to do that, where are we going to send them to get their yeah. cat licensed? Oh, this is what I'm saying. You no, yeah, I'm it, just saying if there was a county there that did it, then yeah, we could just do, hey, you have to go and, you know, like a dog license is having, you have to get your cat license too. But if there's no organization that does that, how are we going to issue a license? Like a cat registry almost? Right. So it's just like that, that, that in itself would present problems. Oh, well, I'm not doubting yeah. a bit. We went around and around about this when I am a citizen. Mm -hmm. And like I say, <coughs> when you don't get no help from the county, the county says it's the city's problem. Then the city says, no, it's the county's problem. You're hitting a brick wall. I don't know the answer. I, it's a tough one. It's going to take some research. And I mean, I have a cat problem too. You know, I think it's, I don't think anyone's immune to the cat problem. It's not nearly as bad as that was described. Um, but it is. It's one of those things that are just so hard to enforce and get a program there that one is legal two consistency is the key keeping up on it and then having some teeth behind you if you can do that as far as issuing the license but yeah that's just the solution i mean i'm telling you we went around five years ago about this mm -hmm. thank you mr cobb Ms. hopkins um, you're right that's great mr cobb i agree with you a hundred percent i've always wondered why we have to license dogs, but you can't license cats. I've had a new car, and I come out and I got cat footprints all over. I can't work in my um, flower garden, and I live in New Carlisle on spinning. But I was wondering, would I be allowed to research this and see mm -hmm. if the county would want to um, start a program to license cats? Because I would really like to research this because I think they should be licensed like dogs. If you own a cat, I mean, if you own a dog, you have to have it licensed. You've got to be responsible for it. And I think if you own a cat, you should have the same thing. And my family has indoor cats, so I'm not a cat hater or anything. It's just that I think you should be responsible for your own pets. Well, for your walk to go to the county, you've got to go to the county commissioner. And they're going to send you right back to him. Well, let me no, no, because here's the thing: because when it, the county government is an extension of your state government, so if the county goes and says, like, "Hey, Miss Hopkins, we love your research. We want to look and doing it," they still have to go and go through what they have to. So I started googling like license for cats, and I haven't seen thing come up. Oh, I found it. Um, I really just started doing research where we're sitting here, so. Uh, doesn't say that they're protected. I mean, so that's. And I'm not talking like, about releasing them and, you know, or doing anything bad to them. I'm just talking about making cat owners responsible for their pets. And I will research it and see what would come up and I'll get with you. Yeah. You got to start somewhere. Yep. Absolutely. Right. And I've done things before, like at Wright State, it didn't exist and I was able to create something. So. 
maybe we, you know it might be a long road, but maybe it can be started. There you go. And if in a couple of years, if the budget keeps going strong, why can't we create our own animal control department? Right. And we'll just have a code enforcement guy who goes around and looks at, you know, try to tackle that. Yeah. So you got to start somewhere, but I mean, that's how, you, that's how we get things started, by people coming and voicing their concerns at their public meeting. And then we get together and we address how the best move forward. So I know we had an issue with it years ago, and it's not going away now, and it's not probably going away anytime future. Um, but it definitely is a learning opportunity to see where we can do better. Sure. Mr. Graham, did you have something? Oh, okay. All right. Please. My name is Terry Hoffman. I live at 316 South Scott Street. I am a cat lover, though I currently don't have any cats. But I would suggest, in the instance of someone who has an indoor cat that accidentally gets out, that if you would start any kind of trapping program of any kind that you work with an organization that checks for microchips because this really displays the importance of having your pets microchip. That's a good idea. It is. Thank you. Anyone else under comments from the public before we move on? All right. Thank you very much. And moving on, committee reports, parks and rec. Back to you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. One more thing about the cats. There are a couple of, there's one actually called Calico TNR. My mom just showed me on her phone. Um, they are located in Clark County. It is a volunteer run organization. You can contact them for stray cat, feral cat problems. They will come out and do TNR for you. Um, I would assume they probably have microchip checking abilities, um, but they do also do the ear notching so that you know that they're fi they cut off the tip of their ear and you know that they're fixed. Okay. Um, Did you say the name so was Calico TNR? Calico TNR. <laughs> and I suspect there's probably more of them available. Um, I just don't know what they are offhand. Sure. Okay, moving on. Parks and Recreation Board. We are planning to host an Easter egg hunt this year, right here in Smith Park. Um, we are planning for Saturday, April 4th. Um, Council, I know that I have already sent out the information to you, um, which is exactly what I have here. We have made a couple of changes as of our last Parks and Recreation meeting. Um, we are now going to do, uh, we split up our age groups. Actually, we combined, I shouldn't say split up. Um, we're going to do, Instead of having two groups for the oldest children, we're going to combine those into children that are eight years old and up. And the reason for that is because we're making a much larger area for them to hunt, because we want to make it challenging. Um, so instead of trying, and with the layout of the park, we're trying, we were trying to find areas where, you know, we weren't just putting eggs down on the ground. We had trees or things that we could hide them in, make it a little bit of a challenge. Um, so because of that, we've decided that we're going to put those two groups together um, and just make a much larger area so they can kind of spread out and, and go crazy with it. Um, other than that, there has been a little bit of discrepancy over the cost for this event. Um, I will say, from my standpoint, um, I don't mince words. I'm a little miffed because when I first presented this idea at the first couple of Parks and Rec meetings, I said, you know, we can do this supplies six to 800 bucks, if that's maybe a, a high estimate, um, and, that, and it was fine. Every, oh yeah, that's perfect, we can do it, no big deal, let's do it. Well, now that it's been done, um, it's been called to question that there may be cheaper alternatives, and the thing that I wanna point out about that is Cheaper cost also often means cheaper quality. Um, so that's my issue um, with what you sent me specifically from National, I don't remember what it was called, National. Entertainment. Yes. Uh, my concern with the toy filled eggs there is they're 
most of the, th the th and of course they don't give you a list of what's actually in there. They say photo is representative of what typically we use. Um, but a lot of those things I don't think are appropriate for children under the age of three or four, I think it lists on the website. I don't know how many kids we're going to have out here that are going to be that little. Um, but in talking with, I've talked to about 10 to 12 different parents about this. Um, generally, the consensus is pre-filled eggs are not the way to go. They're cheap, chintzy prizes. They go in the garbage pretty quickly. Um, from my standpoint, personally, I'm pretty passionate about this because this has kind of been like my, this has been one of the things that I've wanted to do ever since Parks and Rec got revived. So um, I don't believe in putting on an event just for the sake of doing it. I think if we're going to do it, we need to do it quote unquote right. Um, and, and I don't want our, I don't want people to be disappointed, especially not if it's a matter of a couple hundred bucks. You know, if we're talking a price difference of what I want to do is 10 grand and what's being suggested as an alternative is five grand, absolutely, I get it. But we're splitting hairs over a couple hundred dollars and I just disagree strongly. Okay. <laughs> Well, Council, do you have anything to add or question on this? Can I jump topic? in? I'm sorry to be rude. Can I just jump in real quick? Of course. Yeah. I, here's the thing. And me and Brandy get along great. And this has been the one thing where it's just like, okay. And it, she did. The budget was there. And it was fine. But one, the budget hasn't been set yet. My issue came in when we started getting things back from the order. Okay. For example, a um, 108 piece of Mars variety mix you can get at Walmart for $8.98. We end up paying $54 for you know, a box of or a thing of 20 uh, little smiley face things for 50 of them were $27.99. You get a very comparable thing at Walmart for like seven bucks. So it really wasn't so much of that. It was, and I disagree with you, um, $200 of taxpayer money, we take very seriously. And when that is the case that we can have the very similar thing done for a much cheaper cost, we on this side of the fence and you guys, on, we take that very seriously. And we did recommend the National Entertainment Company. Many cities and municipalities use that. Uh, Debbie uses a, a Bethel Township when they do their Easter egg hunt. You, you don't know what kind of toy you're going to get. You don't. The candy is either like a Tootsie Roll or a sweet tart. You know, but at the end of the day, and I don't have kids, I mean, it's an Easter egg hunt. They're going to get these eggs. They're going to open the eggs, and then probably two days later, they're going to eat the candy or throw the toy away to begin with. So it's not, so I don't want to question about, and I, she's done a, fantastic job of getting great little things to go in there. My only issue was how much we paid for it. And I, the Parks and Rec, they're doing great things. They are doing great things. And you know, she ordered some fantastic out of the box things to put in these eggs. But it just comes down to, can we get a very similar product for a cheaper cost? And that's, that's really what it came down to. Um, so <coughs> yeah, I do have an issue with overspending something that we can do very comparable and save that because that's two hundred dollars and go back in your budget for something else. Correct. Um, one thing that I, one of my biggest difficulties with accepting your reasoning behind this is, and we've talked about this. Um, I can't help that it w that nobody paid attention to what shipping charges were going to be when they put placed the order. To me, that's common sense. If you're going to order something online. You need to pay attention to what your shipping charge is going to be and what the, what the grand total comes out to. I don't miss with you either. So when you send us a list from Amazon as you're representing on behalf of council, we just assume like anyone else who sends us their product list that you've done your own due diligence and you don't send us something that costs thirty four ninety five to ship and a product that was sixteen ninety nine. Right, but when, when we, we had our prime list, we assume, and I already talked to council about this. Yeah, I will take a little bit of responsibility for this, but I. When you send us a list, we assume that you've done your own due diligence. You are working on behalf of council. So it's no different than if, if, if Howie sends me something, we make, sure that the, we make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck. So when you send us the Amazon Prime list, we assume that you had shot us, one, prices that were comparable, and then two, from Amazon Prime, we don't actually have to pay shipping and handling on it. So um, I guess if you're going to send us stuff in the future to buy, Make sure we've, you've done your due diligence with pricing and shipping and handling. And I did. Um, 
So, first of all, I, I'm a little offended okay, at the fact that you on. are saying that I didn't do my due diligence. Brandy, let me step we in for a minute. We had a Brandy. meeting in which Brandy. you said you have a prime account. Brandy, please hold on for just a second, please. Let me jump in for a minute and say something. And this is just my opinion because uh, you guys have been talking through this a lot more than I, I'm aware of or as far as details. I'm going to chalk this up to growing pains because Thank you. growing pains oh, it, yeah. on both sides because um, you know, the, the Parks and Rec Board is, you know, it's been there for a while, but it's also kind of the rebirth, if you will. So, you know, now, you know, we know what Mr. Bridges' expe expectations are. You obviously have heard what his expectations are. Now you, uh, and now you have informed her what you expect from her and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where you guys are going to go with this. I mean, unless we need to step in and figure something out, but um, I, th I think just... I was going to recommend Brandy come see the stuff she has because she'll have to pick and choose what can actually fit to the egg. Right. Whatever she ends up not using, I say we should send back. At this point in time, there's no sense of returning all this stuff. Right. Um, I think that she, uh, $60 of it's not returnable. Any candy she got is not eligible for a return. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's a sunken cost we cannot recover. And there's probably well over a thousand items that she can probably pick this pack this pick and then what is left over we can send back to recoup some of the money or if it's something that's not um food perishable like perishable it could be held over to next year well and that was the other thing some of the i chose a lot of things that are not easter specific um so that if there are leftovers they could potentially be used for something else or put towards next year but they're they're just little goofy little toys i mean right. The other thing, and the reason why I chose to go that route was in kind of doing a little bit of research and talking with parents. A lot of parents told me, my kids get more candy at Easter than they do at Halloween. Really want to kind of scale that back. And I'm like, absolutely, I support that 100%. Um, so that was why we kind of went more in that direction versus going with candy. Um, so what it boils down to is, so we've decided to keep what she's ordered. Is that what we're doing? No, I still think she should go and go through the stuff and then we can send some stuff back. Okay. Because that can be fed into their other budget for marketing. I mean, there's no guarantee she's gonna need finger puppets, you know? Some of that stuff though was purchased with the idea that it is appropriate for children under the age of three. That was, that's the goal is that it, I'm trying to be all inclusive. Um, I certainly don't want a parent to show up with their, you know, two month, two, two month old, two year old, sorry child and get something and be like oh well you know, my, my kid can't even have this what's the mm -hmm. point so well there's also going to be a learning curve for you as well and i don't mean this in a mean way no any, that was actually going to be my next any, point any new event you're going to you know how many people is really going to show up i mean hopefully every kid in town does but you know it's i mean any new event for any organization's a learning curve um so I'd like to hear some feedback from council, what they think, I mean, because ultimately I think this is kind of our place. I've got an opinion, <laughs> which is not unnormal. Um, okay. I agree with um, the mayor that it is a learning curve, and I think you both need to learn to compromise a little bit more. I know you want some of the things sent back, and you want to and keep them, but I think maybe you can get together and decide. But also, um, when you're ordering stuff online, I know how hard it is and not realizing the shipping costs and different things. So, like Mike said, it is a, a learning process. I think it is wonderful that you're involved in this and that you take it mm -hmm. so personal because I know there's probably been other Easter egg hunts, but I remember my son was three years old and I brought him to a city Easter egg hunt and it was really great, And but it was a long, long time ago. So I don't want to discourage anything to keep you from being involved. And um, I hope you guys can work it out to where we don't have to get involved. But um, I understand what you're saying. Randy, when you suggested those eggs before, when we talked about an Easter hunt last year, one of the first things I thought was that there was a lot of uh, stuff that little kids couldn't have. And so I understand where you're coming from that. So maybe you guys can get together and compromise on this. 
That's a great, great, awesome thing to say. Um, that board does not report to me. That board reports to city council. So any involved, like, I, I, when they go to order stuff, they give us the order form. But like I said in the work session, I suggest that you guys appoint some people at the Parks and Rec Board. It's because of that. That board does not report to anyone on this administration. I was going to say, then why are you involved? But because well, she had sent me the stuff to order. So if they go to order things, then that's when I get involved. She, give me, she gives me a list of what to order. Then I just turn around and order for them. Well, I'm going to be on the board. Not be on it, but sit in. Yeah. Sit in. Yeah. Well, we and so maybe I can parts. help with some of this. And that's exactly why we why we went that direction because we are. And I get it. I've never done an Easter egg hunt before. I've never done an event other than anything that, like a potluck at work, which is just bring some food and we're going to eat. So this is pretty much in its infancy. We have no idea what we're doing, which is why we've spent a large portion of our first three meetings hammering out what we have to do to follow the rules because we are an extension of council. I mean, it's been a process and I've learned a lot, still learning more. Um, one thing that I do want to touch back on that Randy and I have discussed is, is it worth it at this stage in the game to, and I don't know, we may have to go through that list and see what's what's returnable, but he had mentioned that a lot of the things will have to pay a 20% restocking fee. So is it worth it to eat that shipping cost that we've already paid and then turn around and pay a 20% restock fee? I feel like at this point, okay, maybe I messed up. I will own it. I get it. I have no problem. I should have done things differently. But again, I'm learning just as much as everybody else is. Um, there's only one item that has a 20%. That was the first one. That big okay. Candy. So everything else, like I said, is eligible for return except the candy. Sure. The candy we cannot return at all. Like the puppets, the bouncy balls, we have to like March 13th. That's why I said okay. let her come in and see what she can get into the eggs and then decide what she wants to keep. And if we send some back, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just the learning curve. Mr. Cobb. Mm -hmm. Mr. Breger, and nothing against what you're doing, but you have to come before council so we can go into budget. Budget's going to be done next Thursday and Friday. It won't be voted on until March 16th. March 16th. You have to come. Council has to figure out a budget for Parks and Rec. We got to figure out one for. You know, one, uh, um, for Mr. Kickham on streets and stuff like that. We gotta have a budget for everything. You just can't jump in there and start doing it. I'm not criticizing you, but you can't ju just jump in and start buying without informing council. Well, I understand that, and I did that at the direction of Mr. Bridge. I said, do I need to present this to council before I go ahead and send you this list and before I go ahead and buy this? And he said, no, it's fine. I can go ahead and order it. Well, we had also, Mr. Cobb, at the uh, last year's work session we uh, i can't remember the dollar amount but they were approved and it was budgeted for yes but we took that out when we bought the other truck no no, no. We because they, yes no. we did because we was going to repay the driveway out here they only no. took half no. no and they they have they have temporary appropriations we're all running on temporary appropriations that we passed at the beginning of the year to get us through to a permanent budget is Done. What happened last year is they were trying to do one last year, but we waited too late, and then the product would come in. So when she handed me the list, I said, no, we'll just go ahead and get it because of the timing with Easter coming up and then everyone rushing to get their stuff. But they have a, they have a temp, we have temporary appropriations we're operating on. But in the future, now we'll have Amy there, or if that's who you guys show, choose to put on her, that can help guide them with, with that kind of stuff. Mr. Cook. I'm going to make a recommendation. We table this until the Tuesday meeting. Okay. And consequently, the council members that we're going to appoint to work with you sit down along with Mr. Bridge and we work this thing out in that meeting. The reason I'm saying that. Council has a job to do as far as transparency. If we don't do our 
homework and do our transparency, then that kind of reflects on this group. So I'm thinking that we should be able to work this out between the parties involved. All members of the council can attend that meeting because it is a publicized meeting. And at that point, I think it can come back to council. We'll know a little bit better about the budget. We'll have a little bit better understanding of what's going on, what we've got to work with. So my recommendation is table this until that Tuesday meeting. We get the members of council appointed to work with you and go from there. My fear, and this is just in general, it has nothing to do with what you've just suggested, Mr. Cook. Um, my fear is that, you know, I've been on this board for a couple of years now. We've not been successful in doing anything thus far. Um, and my fear is that if it becomes this much of a long, drawn out process every single time we want to do something, you're basically cutting our noses off to spite our faces. We're going to be stymied before we ever start because I can tell you right now personally, just in dealing with this one thing, I'm really questioning whether or not it's worth it. I mean, I want to do good things for our city and I understand that there are rules that have to be followed. I probably understand better than some of the other folks, but I just, we just want it to be fun. We don't want it to be a situation where we have to have multiple meetings and we have to drag everybody and their brother in to weigh in. And we just want to say, hey, this is what we'd like to do. This is our estimated cost. What do you guys think? And we just want to move forward. I don't want to continue having this debate over the cost. I just want to put it behind us and go ahead because I've already made this beautiful flyer that I want to advertise this event so that, because from what I've seen, there's only two other egg hunts I've seen advertised already. And I would like to get us out there and let people know that it's happening so that we can hopefully draw people from other places. Brandy, I can understand your frustration. But think about the fact you're with just parks and recreation. We have a whole gamut. I of frustration that we go through time in and time out trying to figure out where to stretch the dollar how to respond to a citizen that wants their street done we don't have enough money to do it i understand where you're coming from believe me i think we all do and i'm just trying to make this a smoother transition save a lot of time i think we can work this out i think so too um Moving on, there's one other thing that I want to mention, and this is a Parks Board is going to put it to council, and then you guys get to decide what you want to do. Um, we would really, really like to see improved parking and expanded parking here at Smith Park, because this is going to be the focal point of the majority of the, the events that we are going to do. Um, what our idea is, um, and this is before my time, but Kathy and Tana are familiar with it. Um, apparently there used to be, and there's still a little pad over there, but there used to be a, a turn in off of Washington street that led up into some additional parking. We would like to see, um, you know, we, I want to put that before you guys to consider because if we do start hosting events here, parking is going to be a big issue. Um, we'd actually talked about that a couple of times, a couple of different ideas, uh, putting some sort of small parking out here in the flat area behind us, uh, putting some um, handicap accessible parking up front, widening the road. So um, that'll probably come up during budget. I don't know the logistics and what we can and can't do. That's, exactly. That's Mr. Kitko's area, but um, it's definitely been talked about. Um, but yeah, one I, just back one more time, Brandy. Um, I, th I think once we get over this one bump, I think you'll be okay. Don't let it get, don't, it's, no, you know, it's never personal. I mean, no, it's not. I just know that come May, my stress level is going to be about here no, because I'm going back to school. Yeah. So I need just, to be able to, to kind of facilitate things. Um, one other thing that I actually need to get with you about, Mr. Bridge, I've got some great ideas that I want to talk to um, the board about at our next meeting for Memorial Day. For what? Memorial Day. Oh, like you guys want to take the whole thing over? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, well, I do. I, I've got to get the uh, 
Got to get the go ahead from the others, but I've spoken with um, a friend of mine that works with Honor Flight Dayton. Mm -hmm. She's got some great ideas for some things that we could do to really make that hopefully make that um, an event that will draw out some people. Uh, Mr. Mayor, sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Vice Mayor said something. It's actually a publicized meeting for the Parks and Rec Board, not City Council. So you guys could not have a majority here. It's a publicized meeting for the Parks and Rec Board. When that ad went out, it said the Parks and Rec Board meets, not City Council and Parks and Rec Board. Right. So if you guys majority want to go, uh -huh. you need to have uh, Emily put it at it. So we can all have three. To stay home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Where's your sense of adventure? <laughs> I think there's, I think if you point Amy to it, Amy's more than welcome to go in there. We just, it sounds a lot worse. We'd had an issue over pricing of things. That's all it is. Right. Other than what they're doing and all that other stuff, that is between that board and that council, you guys tell us what to do. We just had a shock with the $54 bag of candy. Right. That is it. That is the only issue that we had had. So I don't want the public to think or anyone else sitting there that it's a drama filled place. It's not. They've got fantastic things upcoming. And then once it was we, just that pricing is, is, was the only issue. And then once we get these two individuals appointed. Absolutely. That will be attending got, yep. your guys' meetings to help out in any way they can. They should, Do we have another one on the radar? No, I mean as a council member. Oh, I thought you meant in, another individual no, appointed to no, no, Parks. No. Sorry. So, all right. Um, yep. Last but not least, our next scheduled meeting for the New Carlisle Parks and Recreation Board is a week from today, February 25th at 1 p.m. right here at the Shelter House. All right. Thank you very much. All right. And moving on. Uh, Ms. Berner, can you read or would you rather someone nope. else? Want me to do it? <laughs> hey, Randy, read it. I want to hear. I want to hear at least try. Listen to my voice. <laughs> I love Disney movies. <laughs> All right, starting off with resolution 2020-03R, introduction, public hearing, and action tonight. Resolution amending resolution 19-19R, the capital improvement program for the city of New Carlisle, Ohio, for additional capital purchases. Council. <laughs> motion. <laughs> Who, first, second. Who is first? Mr. Cobb. Cobb. Or second Cook? by Ms. Eggleston. Cobb. Cobb. Cobb Eggleston. Cobb. That's, who, that's who I am. Right? <coughs> you want to go over this, Mr. Bridge? Yeah, I'm taking notes real quick. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. Explanation no, no. of this resolution. Uh, this allows us to amend the CIP we voted uh, on last year to buy the cemetery truck. Council, any questions? When you're ready, Ms. Berner. Right. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilwoman Grimm. Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Accepted 7 0. <coughs> Resolution 2020 04 R. Introduction, public hearing, and action tonight. A resolution appointing representatives to the Transportation Coordinating Committee. Motion to accept 2020 Second. An explanation of this ordinance, this actually follows up on the motion that you guys did last meeting to appoint two people to the uh, TCC board. Council, any discussion? When you're ready, please. Okay. Vice Mayor Cook? Yes. Mayor Lowry? Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilman Cobb? Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston? Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. <coughs> you want somebody to read? No, I'm good. Okay. A few more, you got to listen to me. Ordinance 2020 03, public hearing and action tonight. An ordinance amending section 1040 of the codified ordinances of the city of New Carlisle, Ohio, regarding the delivery of bills and fees for credit card and debit card payments. Make a motion to accept 2020-30. Second by Mr. Cook. Cobb and Cook. Cobb and Cook. Uh, this ordinance amends our uh, section of code 1040-16 that deals with our water. Um, we are changing the authority, which is us that usually delivered the bills. We are changing that to a third party vendor since we are going forward with the new water bills or utility bills. 
It also expands the definition to say credit card and or debit card payments will be assessed a fee. Council, any discussion? Are you ready, please? Right, Mayor Lowry? Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilman Cobb? Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston? Yes. Vice Mayor Cook? Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. <clears throat> ordinance 2020 04, public hearing and action tonight. An ordinance amending section 1042 of the codified ordinances of the city of New Carlisle, Ohio, regarding the delivery of bills and fees for credit card and debit card payments. So I'll move. Second. Eggleston Hopkins. In an explanation of this ordinance, this is uh, very similar to one we just approved. This one has to do with our wastewater. So again, we're changing the authority to third party vendor and then also expanding the debit credit card. <clears throat> Council, any discussion? And when you're ready, please. Councilman Krim? Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilman Cobb? Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston? Yes. Vice Mayor Cook? Yes. Mayor Lowry? Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins? Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. <clears throat> Ordinance 2020 05, public hearing and action tonight. An ordinance authorizing the city manager to purchase a new pickup truck for the cemetery department. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Cook. Okay. Uh, this al uh, ordinance allows me to spend over my $20,000 threshold to buy a new cemetery truck. Any discussion, Council? Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Didn't we have a problem a ways back with a Ford squad with engine problems? I, not that I can that recall. Do you have any so, recollection of that? Yeah, sometime back in, I think, the oh, 11, 12, so, there was a problem with a Ford engine back in the day with uh, eating up the coaling um, it, uh, stuff inside the engine, the blocks and things like that. So but, this, this would not have the same Oh, no, no, that engine's been long gone. Yeah. Well, I know Mr. Bridge just said $200 is a big deal, but I think it would be worth an extra $1,000 to deal with a company within the city limits that pays city taxes. Oh, we're talking about the truck. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> any other Thank you, sir. Council, any other discussion? I agree. All right. And Ms. Berner, when you're ready, please. Um, <clears throat> Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilman Grimm. Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. <clears throat> Almost done. Ordinance 2020 06, public hearing in action tonight. An ordinance authorizing the city manager to enter into a memorandum of agreement with Security National Bank for the deposit of public funds. Eggleston Cobb. Eggleston Cobb. Uh, explanation of this ordinance. Uh, we need to have an agreement on uh, any time that we deposit public funds into a bank. Uh, as I was saying in the work session, uh, they do it on different intervals. PNC, I think, does one every five years. Security, I think, is every three years. Uh, don't quote me on that. But any time that we said we're going to put some taxpayer money into your bank, we've got to have legislation behind it. Council, any questions or discussion? When you're ready, please. Right. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. Councilman Nowakowski? Yes. Councilman Cobb? Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. Ordinance 2020 07, public hearing and action tonight. An ordinance amending Chapter 248 of the codified ordinances of the City of New Carlisle regarding city policy. Mr. Grimm? Mr. Grimm. Ms. Eggleston? And an explanation of this ordinance, this is actually a newly uh, written policy that will deal with the iPad that the council will be utilizing as of March 2nd. Any discussion, council? When you're ready, please. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Cook? Yes. Mayor Lowry? Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins? Yes. Councilman Grimm? Yes. 
Councilman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. As long as I don't have to. Councilman. <laughs> yes. Accepted seven zero. Ordinance 2020-08, public hearing and action tonight, an ordinance amending chapter 246 of the codified ordinances of the city of New Carlisle regarding employees generally. Some. Eggleston Cobb. Cook. Or Cook, sorry, sorry, sir. <laughs> hey, yeah, do Mayor. that to him too, sir. Mayor, thank <laughs> Uh, explanation of this, uh, we are amending uh, Chapter 246 that deal with uh, the issuance and uh, of city password for email accounts, and then also some mention about some IT professionals since we contract out with the bridge group. Council, any discussion? Please. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilman Grimm. Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yes. Councilman Eggleston. Yes. Motion accepted 7 yes. zero. Don't forget you, Vice Mayor Cook. Sorry. <clears throat> Last one, Ordinance 2020 09. <laughs> Public hearing in action tonight. An ordinance amending Chapter 276 of the codified ordinances of the City of New Carlisle, Ohio, regarding boards and commissions. So moved. Second. Thank you. Eggleston, Eggleston Hopkins. Hopkins. Oh, Eggleston, Eggleston who? I thought. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, an explanation of this ordinance. This has to do with the um, a catch all under 27602 for all our Title VIII boards and commissions. So that's Parks and Rec boards, BZA, basically anything that has a, a board that says you do need, in fact, to be a citizen of the city of New Carlisle to be on that board. Thank you, sir. Council, any discussion? And when you're ready, Ms. Burner. Councilman Graham? Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yes. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Accepted 7 0. Right. Um, other business. Let me read it. If you can. You're on a Wait a minute. You're no. Congressman Warren Davidson will hold his mobile office hours at the city building on the fourth Tuesday of each month from 1 30 p.m. until 2. Okay, um, we will need uh, two things, a motion to, we talked about this in the work session, to appoint two individuals for one main and one backup council member for the Parks and Rec Board. So, so for, for who? What were the? Nominate. To appoint two members now. Which two members? I was one of them. I wanted to. Right. I would nominate Amy. We don't. We can just appoint them. We need a second, though. Wasn't it like one main I mean, and one alternative, just yeah. in case the main couldn't go? Yeah. That's yeah. What one main, one alter alternate. So we just okay. need the name of the two people. I'll be the alternate. Okay. So Miss Hopkins is the main, and Mr. Graham is the alternate. Still call me Connor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy. I mean Dale. <laughs> Motion to appoint um, Councilman Hopkins as the main and yep. Councilman Grimm as the alternate correct. for the Parks and Board, right, whatever, uh, yeah, whatever it's, it's called. Correct. <coughs> Parks and Rec Board. And do we have a first or a second? Yeah, yeah. Second. first and second. Okay. Cobb and Eggleston. Yep. Any discussion? No. When you're ready. Okay. <coughs> um, Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Yes. Councilman Graham. Yes. Councilwoman Nowakowski. Yes. Councilman Cobb. Yes. Yeah. Councilwoman Eggleston. Yes. Motion accepted 7 0. Okay. And then one more thing I want to bring up. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. I apologize, but it's getting late in the year and in the night. Um, fireworks for the city it's been discussed a couple of times i know we haven't got to the budget yet but as far as at least getting a tentative date um it's been discussed i think from city managers some council members just people have different ideas um i just want to throw out my two cents i would like to keep it on uh, how we've done it the past two years which is one week prior to the fourth of july um for a handful of reasons 
and mostly because of the businesses. I mean, the local businesses that night have just done, you know, Air Queen is just one of their busiest nights. Subway, Pizza Plus, IGA sells like all their alcohol that night. Um, and it's just a good time for the town. So, and I guess the farmer's market is wanting to do their opening um, weekend at the baseball field that night under the lights, which I think would be that. So that would add some more down to the ball field for that event. So um, my suggestion and my thoughts is June 27th for the fireworks, which is pretty much how we've done it the past two years. Right, but I just want to get at least a tentative date. Yeah, I, I know I discussed with Mr. Cook on the 27th. Okay, great. So does council have any problems with that? 27th. Okay, so June. Mr. Bridge, did you catch that? Just to that. I got you. Cool. All right, anything else, council, before we serve? I attended the Transportation Coordinating Committee last Friday. The only thing major that did occur there was the fact that the uh, I won't say that. Mr. Baird, who was the chairman, is dropping off of Enon's council, so he had to step down. And the uh, Clark County engineer took over the chairmanship. So other than that, pretty much everything is standard paperwork. Good to know. Anything else, council, before we wrap it up? All righty. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. When we're voting yes. right now, right? Correct. Vice Mayor Cook. Yes. Mayor Lowry. Yes. Councilwoman Hopkins. Definitely. Councilman Grant. I'm ready. Councilman Kowski. Councilman Cobb. Here. Councilman Nagelstick. Yep. Right. The top numbers. Except.